four and a half, five day conference. Yep. Katya. Oh, thank you very much. Excellent. Oh, great again to see such a terrific turnout here tonight. Thank you so much um, to all of you for making our community what it is. Um, when Joe says fresh off the plane, I um, yeah, I arrived at nine o'clock this morning. I'm not entirely sure what time it is or where I am. Uh, so I'm going to run you through a four day conference <laughs> with, <laughs> with um, uh, probably poor jokes and uh, some things that are inaccurate. Um, so I went to Interaction 17. <laughs> I uh, know, right? Um, so we have a, a, a huge global community, and I think we we see here we you know, we get 100, uh, 200 people in the room every time when just Sydney gets together. So this is a conference of over a thousand designers from all over the world, and it's amazing. Um, I spent my first uh, day uh, just before the conference actually at the local leaders workshop. Um, all the local leaders from the regions all get together um, to talk about what's going on and to um, understand what's happening in each other's chapters and things like that. Um, this is a picture of all the local leaders on the most freezing day in New York on the most freezing rooftop. I don't know whose idea this was, but we did it anyway. Um, and the sorts of stuff that gets shared at the local leaders workshop was the IFDA board strategy. So they talked about the types of things that they're focusing on in the year. Um, they're at draft with that, so it's not quite ready to share. But the sorts of things they were talking about was better engagement with academia. Um, talking better with uh, universities and also with the people who are running the, um, the compressed courses as well and engaging with them and finding out ways that we can um, make sure that the whole community gets lifted up in a um, we talked a lot about doing more for our experienced um, crew because we have a lot of people, and this is true for Australia, for, uh, for the States, there are a lot of people coming through courses who are learning um, and changing careers, um, but there's a lot of people who've been in the industry for 10 years, 20 years, and we want to also support them as well as the people who are new to our industry. Um, and the, we, as we were working through problems, um, we ended up in this entirely huge conversation about better communication between the chapters because as I met and talk to more of the people from um, around the world, the more I realise that the way that we run this chapter here, um, we are a, a gold standard IXTA chapter. Um, and everybody should be really, really proud of that. And the types of things that I told them about what we were doing there, they were like, oh, can you share that with us? Oh, could you send that to us? And I was like, yeah, for sure. Um, so we should all really be proud of our community because we are gold standard and um, the rest of the world's a bit jealous. Yay. Um, so the key themes for the work for the uh, for Interaction 17, it was uh, design in context and the whole idea was, you know, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. It's all about being in New York. Um, There's a lot of VR and AR conversations, a lot of chatbots and conversational UIs, smart homes and meshing of digital and uh, physical applied futures, which is a, that was something um, that was a bit new and interesting for me. Um, our responsibility as designers, because of the power that we have and the lives that we touch, and there was a hell of a lot of apologising for Donald Trump. Um, I heard some really great Donald Trump jokes um, and I think the, the best perpetrator of them was the first lady um, Chelsea Malden who gave one of the keynotes. Now she works for um, the Public Policy Lab um, and she works with people who are in jails, people who are in education. They're trying to really do things that are um, helping people who are in need and at risk. So it's difficult stuff. And she actually came out, um, I think well, maybe it was, she said, please don't paint us all with the same tangerine brush, something like that. Um, I can't claim the joke. <laughs> Um, and so she was saying, you know, when the state is unjust, you know, you've got to resist. And I went to dinner in New York on the first night that I got there and um, joined in a protest on my way and then went to the Chinese restaurant. So it's, it's that level of agitation and protest that's going on there, which is very, um, it's foreign to, foreign to me. I don't usually walk up the road to get Chinese food and there's a protest. Um, so she was talking about uh, the seeing users as owners of their experience because a lot of the time as we are creating interactions we're subjecting users to the experience or dictating what they should be doing or how they should behave or trying to change their behavior so she was looking um, to us to try and be allow them to be owners and the other thing that really resonated which is something that I'm seeing a lot in my practice as well, is to design for both sides of the, the coin, design for the people who are using the service and design for the people who are delivering the service, which I think is a really interesting dynamic and she talked a little bit about that um, in the context of a public 
a, a bus driver. So she interviewed the bus driver about driving the school bus and she interviewed school kids about being on the school bus and then designed the service to be better, taking both sides of it. Um, and I really liked her enable righteous acts, so you know, go out there with our power and do good. Um, Brenda Laurel, uh, Laurel did, um, she's an independent uh, designer and she talked about, you know, VR and AR, what's the story? Um, it was, her, her talk was a, a story and it involved some um, holiday snaps of people's legs underwater, which I wasn't quite able to connect with the VR AR. But the thing that came out of this one, which I really like, was she had some heuristics for VR, which I think is valuable. Um, she talked about uh, heuristics for good VR being providing rich environments, um, revealing content and characters and using humor. Um, she talked about planting clues and surprise because, you know, fun, fun theory is all about surprise. Um, supporting emergent goals and behaviors because as people use VR and AR, their goals change and their behaviors change and you've got to be able to support that. Um, setting up for moments of delight and designing really good endings. Uh, so you can uh, go and have a look at her, her stuff online, um, but I just wanted to share that there are heuristics that maybe we can apply because we all do like a good heuristic as an interaction designer. Um, and uh, Gary uh, Huswit was a, a good speaker as well about cinematic VR. So people are talking about VR less in the context of, um, I don't know, making making environments for people to just wander around in. So the uses of VR I've seen in Australia has been transport for New South Wales have created uh, VR of the new light rail that's going up Devonshire Street. Um, and so he was talking about using it um, in, a, in a cinematic way and he was saying that VR is very good for place setting and for making people feel like they're in the environment, but it's really bad for showing you detail and it's also really bad at motion because um, your eyes say you're moving but your body says you aren't and that's why you throw up, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> Um, he also talked about uh, VR designers needing to think like architects, which I thought was really interesting because architects are thinking in that 3D space and in those you know, the buildings and modeling buildings and things like that. So I thought that was an interesting um, application of those skills to VR. Um, and also thinking like a magician, shifting focus, because when you're trying to cinematically tell a story in VR and there's a crucial plot point that involves that bottle down there, if your head's looking over here and you miss it, well, you can't follow along with the story. So it's, it's all about the direction of focus as well, which I thought was cool. Um, it's just a, yeah, just the last one on the, the VR. This one is, I didn't really want to talk too much about these guys' um, talk, but what they have created is a thing called Storyboard VR, which is effectively Sketch for VR. Um, I, I've put it on these slides, there's some little things for you to Google and some places for you to go and visit. Um, and they talked about uh, prototyping in VR being really, really important, it, just as important as any kind of design work that you're doing. Um, and they also talked about that choreography of focus as well, making sure that people uh, see the thing that you want them to see or their attention is drawn to the place that you want it to be. Um, but I've put a, a link in there to um, Storyboard VR, so people who are interested in, in trying to have a crack with that, well, this is an easy tool for you to get started, apparently. I haven't tried it myself, but give it a go and report back. Um, I'd be really interested to hear what anybody um, does with this. Okay, um, sadly I got lost and between the venues and I missed half of this magnificent man's talk. He talked about um, conversational uh, user, well, conversation, the conversation theory, right? So nowhere into the sort of the chatbot section. Um, so he's the chair and associate professor, professor at the College for Creative Studies um, and I got there just as he put this excellent diagram up there but did not get any of the context of what this diagram is about. Um, and I, my, from the notes that I was looking at, he was talking about conversation as a giving and taking of control and that we give and take control at different points in time. Um, and as we go through the conversation, we form agreements and that's how we get to understanding of what each other is saying. We have a thing that we agree on. Um, and because I don't really know exactly how that picture came into being, I've put the links there for his website and for the conversational theory written by a gentleman um, that he referenced, Gordon Pask. As, and you can get all of the PDFs and read up on that. So what you do with this is you take the conversational theory and then you can start having a look into chatbots. So Elizabeth Allen works at Shopify. Um, she's a UX researcher there and she came and talked a little bit about the chatbots that they've put in place. So they've got a few chatbots which are interesting. One is Kit which is 
deliberately gender neutral, um, I understand. And that's a marketing bot that helps their sellers, so people who sell on Shopify. And then they have the messenger bot that um, provides information to people who are buying things on Shopify. Um, and she had a couple of uh, lessons learned. Um, People actually really expect your bot to suck. So you're starting at a very, very low bar. It doesn't matter really what you deliver. If it's crap, then people go, oh, yeah, that's how I was expecting it to be. Um, and bot personality is a thing. Apparently, Kit started out a little too chipper and a little too perky, um, and they needed, <laughs> they needed to dial it back a bit. Um, and the other thing with chatbots is um, that you need to set smart defaults because they tried to empower their... Um, their uh, sellers to set up the bot to do what they wanted it to do, but they found that people weren't really making the time to go and do that. Um, and so I've put a couple of links in there about um, what they've done and, and where they where they're taking that um, future because they're actually they're quite invested in in the idea of this conversational commerce. Um, and this one, Greg Vassello as well, talk, again, talking about prototyping in this different type of user interface. Um, so he talked about all of the, the ways that you can prototype a conversational UI. Um, and I think this, this I just wanted to share with you so that you could have some tools to go and have a look at yourselves as well. So the biggest takeaway that I got from him is if you are starting to design a chatbot, act it out in person first, don't start digital. Make sure that you sit with two people and try and have the conversation that you want the chatbot to have um, and see how it goes because it might be terrible. Um, and there's a, a, all of those uh, large providers, so Facebook, Google, IBM, Microsoft, those are the, the chatbot prototyping tools and the APIs that they are using. Um, he talked about a number of others. There's Bot Society, Motion AI, Bot Kit Studio, and Pull String. Pull String was the one that I thought was most interesting because he talked about how it had templates. Um, so I think that would be the one, if you wanted to explore this technology, is to go to that and have a, have a crack with the templates that they have and see how it works. Um, and so I put the link there for Pull String. But yeah, again, he he said prototyping is really, really important and um, you know, just have fun with it because if, if as, as um, Elizabeth Allen said, you know, people expect it to suck. So if you make it slightly less than suck, it's a really good start. Um, okay, so moving on from that, um, Juliana Rotich was another speaker that I was um, really impressed by the work that she's doing and she was also the, the judges winner for the Interaction Design Awards. So she works, uh, talked about her journey in social entrepreneurship and she works uh, across a number of um, non-profit tech companies. So she works for Ushahidi who specialise in free communication um, and Open source, open source communication between um, people in the developing world. So an example of how a Shahidi gets used is if there's a disaster in a particular part of the world, they will crowdsource information about the relief efforts, they'll crowdsource information about what's safe, what's not safe. And it's, um, it's a really amazing way of, of creating an information flow in um, nations that are less connected than others. Um, and the other thing that she actually um, talked about was she talked about really innovating at the edge because if you're at the edge, then you've got constraints and if you have constraints you have to make them work for you you have to work within them and if it works in Africa apparently it'll work anywhere um, the beautiful uh, work that she showed was uh, brick which is the hardware it, it connects communities who are not connected um, and it's a portable um, hardware-centered uh, option for people in Africa and the little kit that you can see there the Kio kit that's actually a little wheelie hard case and in it, it's got something like 15 uh, tablets um, and a method by which they can connect, um, power the whole lot, and they can wheel that into a classroom and have a lesson plan going for um, for the children in the classroom with very little um, very little need for uh, connect connectivity or power or anything like that. So it's an amazing program, and I would really suggest that you go and have a look at that. Um, and it was a really, really worthy winner of the Judges Award. All right, um, I, can't, I can't do this one justice, okay? So, John Cock, <laughs> who's seen John Cock speak? Okay, it's it's a talk and it's a performance art and it's it's 
you know, I can't, I can't do it justice. I can just tell you what he talked about and then there's a link there so you can go and see a snippet of it before they post the whole thing. But I would say definitely go and have a look at the whole thing. Um, he talked about um, focusing in the age of ambiguity and the chaos of creativity and things like that. And he said as creative people, you know, we are really inclined to self-critique um, and we like to hurt ourselves a lot and say we're bad and not very good at things and we compare ourselves to others. And he talked about a lot of ways that you can get around that and support people as a design leader so you know being able to um, allow people to it, he talks a lot about rules creative rules and saying that rules destroy creativity and he would encourage all of us to go out there and break the rules but we have to own the consequences if we break the rules he tells a, a really terrific story about like messing with the thermostat thing in the building that he works in and like causing all sorts of grief there um, so I would say uh, there's a little uh, snippet that I found from a UX conference at the end of last year where he gave um, a similar talk and touched on some of the themes. So if you want to go and have a little seven minute look, you can now. Um, but yeah, I would say definitely go and have a look at it when it's, uh, when it's live. We'll tweet it on the IXDA Twitter account. Oh, now these, this was really interesting. So this is the um, tell, uh, Tell art, that's right, yeah, it's tell art. Um, and they talked about the field notes for the future. So this is the applied futures thing. Um, they're looking at what kind of applied futures can be in health, education, infrastructure, in human body, domestic space, governance. Um, and they're working with the, um, the United Arab Emirates and they've created something called the Museum of the Future in the United Arab Emirates, which has got all sorts of really out there ideas for health, well-being, cityscapes, all that sort of stuff. Um, and it's all available on their website. You can go and have a look at, um, at the projects they've done. But the one that I've got the photo of there, that's from the um, it's part of their health so they have the pharma cafe um, which is a <laughs> which involves a wellness mist um, in a high-end spa environment and it's got pharmaceutical capabilities so what happens is you go in there uh, and by scanners you are read as to what your physiological state is um, and then it makes a mist for you um, or you know delivers whatever health care you need misting drinks and therapies that are all tailored to your needs so it's fascinating stuff um, and they've got some really weird things they're doing with you know uh, bionic um, eyes bionic knees bionic legs so go and have a look at the tell art site um, and have a, <laughs> have a look at how they're applying the future um, and uh, the last talk that I just wanted to, to um, let you know about was uh, Chelsea Delaney's talk. And these are, there were heaps of other talks. These were my, these were my top ones. I love Chelsea Delaney. She is the, di the Director of Digital User Experience for Planned Parenthood. Um, and she put this talk together, Designing to Combat Misinformation. And she actually put this talk together before the election. So she was like, I feel it's really apt, but now I feel like I'm walking on some interesting turf. Um, so she talked about um, uh, three aspects of misinformation, what the components of misinformation are. Um, the, how you get to misinformation is you, end up, you start out with this homogenous cluster of people who look at the same stuff all over again and then it's this, this, um, this loop that they all get into and then they they all come together into what's called, what's called an echo chamber. So you have multiple homogenous clusters all looking at the same misinformation and perpetuating it amongst that. Um, and then the third thing from that is polarizing it. So if you have a bunch of people who have the other, like something that's completely opposite to them, um, and you have a bunch of other homogenous clusters on the other side, that polarization reinforces to both sides the information that they believe to be true whether it's true or not. So I thought that was really fascinating and obviously that's something that Planned Parenthood have had to deal with a lot. Um, people get misinformation happens because of exposure, because you see it over and over again, because of oversimplification, because somebody tries to make something complex and makes it, uh, take something complex, make it really simple and then it just gets lost in the translation. Um, and having confirmation bias of your own worldview. And her big tip for debunking was if you take a fact out of somebody's, uh, well, if you take an alternate fact out of somebody's head, you leave a space. So you have to put an actual fact in there as well um, to, you know, make make that hole be filled. Otherwise, people will freak out and not listen to you, and and will then go back to believing their misinformation. So it's a very interesting psychological thing that you have to do to debunk um, misinformation. Um, so I put some some links there that you can um, go and have a look at. Um, so this is um, this is the all of the local leaders who attended the conference. Um, I wanted to Photoshop you in there, Joe, but I'm really crap at Photoshop, so <laughs> sorry. I brought you a badge. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, and what I wanted to, to show you here is this is this is like two thirds of the stage. There's like a whole nother third of the stage there with more local leaders on it. And we are part of such a huge, globally diverse community. Um, and uh, what I liked about this conference is they did give a lot of credit to the local leaders and the people who work as volunteers because the conference is run with volunteers. And all of our chapters are run with volunteers as well. Nobody gets paid except Brenda Sanderson because she's in charge of that. She's the executive director. She deserves it. Um, okay, so that's that's sort of a roundup of the conference. And and to go back to the workshops and and the other stuff that I got up to is obviously I you know I did my usual networking stuff. Um, and I had a good chat with um, Jesse from Adaptive Path again because I talked to him a couple of years ago and we've been trying to figure out how we can do a collaboration with the .org work that they've got going on. Now, AdaptivePath.org has reinvented itself in the last two years and it's now a connecting designer for people who want to do, uh, to do social good for social benefit. And they've got a whole heap of frameworks now because I went and met with them in San Francisco. And they're going to share their frameworks with us and we're going to look at how we can um, collaborate between them um, and us in the same ways that they uh, trying to get not profit stuff happening with designers. Um, I've got a couple of, uh, because we, we showcased Indy Young so well last year, we've got a, a few people who are pretty happy to do it. So Dave Maloof is going to do a workshop for us at the end of March on UX strategy. We're just trying to nail a date that's going to work for him. Um, Matt Nishlapidis, he was like full on, sign me up, I'll do it. Happy to do that. So he's another definite for the year. Um, John Colco was very interested in the idea um, and he's, um, I'm working with him to see whether or not it's a format that he wants to explore as well because it's quite cool to be able to tell people I ran a remote workshop in Australia and I made it work um, and we're really um, excited to be able to support that. So those are the workshops that I'm looking at having and I'll send out the Dave Maloof one as soon as I've got a date for you and so next year if you fancy going Interaction 18 is going to be in Lyon, France, way. Uh, although because February it's probably going to be a little bit more like that. <laughs> Um, and yeah, so there, that is the address that you go to if you would like to try and get a ticket. Tickets will be available in early April. I would say get on them fast um, because they go really fast and Leon's beautiful. So everybody should come. It's amazing. Um, thank you very much. I, that's all I've got to share today and um, it's been really great to come in and see you all again. <laughs>